A.S. Morrison Weatherly, Jr. Born in Atlanta, November 19, 1925. What street did you live on here in Atlanta? Cantrell Road, which is off of Peachtree, there just beyond just beyond Roxborough Road, at the intersection of Peachtree Dunwoody. And then I lived originally at you know, on Piedmont Road, down toward the end of Piedmont Road, as you begin to go up the hill toward Roswell Road. So I spent my early boyhood there, and uh, later moved to Cantrell Road and actually it was in 1934 and uh, so I lived there all my life and interestingly enough I still have the house that I lived in. Really? So uh, we just wanted to hold on to it not knowing at some point in time you know when you might need it and there have been one or two occasions that I thought you know being able to scale down from a split level house to a Smaller one, lo you know, one story house, uh, one level house would be a lot easier. But while I was in the military, I lived there. We'll stop. Where were you in Pearl Harbor when was born? No, I was not in Pearl Harbor. No, where were you? Do you remember where you were when you found out that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Well, actually. I was in school at the time because that was just a little earlier. This was in 1941, uh -huh. and uh, at that point uh, I was in high school. And then uh, when I was in service, I did not go into service until 1944. Now, so I you, miss that. So you were in school when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Right. And where did you go to school? Went to originally R.L. Hope Elementary School on Piedmont Road and then North Fulton High School on North Fulton Drive there in Buckhead. And uh, while there, incidentally, we had an ROTC unit. And so during that era, I spent four years in what we call junior ROTC. And so they were just preparing us, you know, for the future as far as service is concerned. So. Uh, that was interesting. What was the reaction from students once they heard about Pearl Harbor? They were just stunned and yet uh, realized too that what we had been doing as far as this military, mm -hmm. that would mean a lot to us, you know, in the next year. I graduated in 1942, so in 41, I was, uh, in the fall, I was a junior. Uh, excuse me, I was a senior. And uh, enjoyed. We had all night uh, vigils, you know, where there would be a team e every night to stay up there in the school to be sure that nothing happened to the school, you know, insofar as vandalism. And uh, at that time, we started uh, doing what is done, you know, in a neighborhood standpoint, is lowering all the shades and, you know, just just like a neighborhood watch. So that's what we were doing in 41, but I was completely stunned, and I commenced to realize, you know, that ultimately if this continued, which it did, that I would no doubt be in service. And uh, following my graduation, I went to Georgia Tech, spent two years there, and while there, that's when I volunteered to go into the Air Corps, as it's called. So what, when did you actually, uh, were you, did you actually volunteer for service or were you drafted? No, I volunteered. I volunteered right at the close of my sophomore year and uh, in March went into service. And I had been taking junior ROTC there at Tech. And so I had two years of junior ROTC there. And I thought that I was not on a program, you know, like what, what the Navy called V-12, which was a study program in college. and while there you would earn your commission. I was not on that program. And so uh, I thought best to go ahead and volunteer. And I had the opportunity to volunteer in the Air Corps and so uh, somewhat being interested in air, air activities, I, I thought that would be really good. And how did you get that opportunity 
to, to volunteer for Air Corps? Well, I really seized it, so to speak. I, I called and went to the Navy to interview. I, I knew about the Army. I really wanted to go into the Air Corps, as it was called then. It's now, of course, U.S. Air Force. But then it was U.S. Air Corps. And uh, they had some openings. Uh, and so they gave me, I would say now looking back, some preferential treatment with respect to the fact, number one, that I volunteered. And number two, you know, I had some military background, so I was able to pass the test and go on in the Air Corps and uh, be what we call an airman. And from there, uh, this was in, as I say, 1944, so much of the build-up to that point had been through younger men who were already established as pilots, navigators, bombardiers. So whereas the schools were almost filled when I came along, and therefore there were other duties that needed to be performed and so I was directed into flexible gunnery, utilization of 50 caliber machine guns. And so I ultimately took that route as far as my service is concerned and then ultimately when I finished uh, going back to Georgia and finishing two senior years, as we call it, senior ROTC there, I received my commission as second lieutenant. Now, where did you do your initial training? The initial training was at uh, Tenderfield, Florida. As far as the gunnery is concerned, I went to Biloxi to the uh, Keesler Field Air Force Base, and that was in what we called basic training. And from there, went to Tenderfield. But I did spend some months there at Biloxi. I know of some that did, and uh, sadly enough, I know two who volunteered. And were, uh, one was in the infantry, I recall, and of course he had, uh, I guess, probably a year after I was in the military, I found that he was a close friend in high school, that I found that he died in action. And uh, of course, I had a neighbor that lived just down the street from me whom I admired very much. He was oh, probably three years older than me. And uh, I just, uh, he, was, he was in the infantry. He had gotten into a program and I believe was an officer and was killed. So those were my two, you know, intimate type experiences. Now, backtrack just a little. Sure. When you, when you volunteered, um, what was the general reaction uh, from your family that you had volunteered? Well, I feel that I had somewhat built this up in their minds just by the fact that I know I'm going in service and my mother and father were real receptive. However, uh, I'm, I was an only child and an only boy, you know, and so there was some concern about that, but that never affected me as far as military was concerned. And so by the time I got to this point of volunteering, they were they were all, all for it. I was age 18 when I volunteered. And so. Uh, you were, uh, you did your, your training and then you said you were commissioned a lieutenant. Right. When did that take place? That took place in 1948. Oh, okay. And then I was in the Air Force Reserve and then ultimately became a first lieutenant. Okay. And then became inactive and uh, received the reserve, well, what we would call the Armed Forces Reserve Medal. Okay. So that's basically what I did after service. Now, kind of to backtrack again, once you completed your, your gunnery training, um, when were you assigned to a unit uh, or to an air crew? When did you deploy out of the United States? All right, well, actually, as I said, I had finished basic gunnery school at Tendlefield, Florida. And then from there, I was selected to go to basic gunnery school as an instructor for an instructor's oh, okay. job. So I went to the, uh, well, actually, the uh, Air Force Base in 
Texas, Laredo Field, which is on the border of Mexico. And then we teamed up there from the standpoint of learning the crewmanship activities. And uh, I spent several months there going through gunner instructor school. And uh, I will remember real quickly that uh, one of my most unusual experiences occurred when we were flying and I was always the last person to get into the plane. And I'd take the chucks, you know, from the wheels, put them in the Bombay rack and get in out of the hot sun. It just felt so good, you know, to have the cool air coming in as the plane took off. And so uh, one day, and we had plywood type boxes, three quarter plywood boxes in the Bombay rack in lieu of the Bombay section. And so I would always customarily get on board and sit on that, what we call a box, you know, with my feet on the catwalk. And I, as you can understand with young people, you know, I, gosh, I was ready to get some, uh, some sleep. <laughs> so uh, I just got to put my head by my, on my elbow on my knee and just begun to snooze. And I said, well, you know, it's unusual today how cool it is. So I guess we had gotten airborne probably about 800 to 1,000 feet. And all of a sudden I looked up and looked around and I was sitting in that Bombay and I was looking down straight at the earth. Oh, and I'll, wow. ne I'll never forget that. And uh, it was just kind of an unusual experience, you know, and to, to have something like that. And so after that I was very careful about boarding the ship, <laughs> needless to say. Now, um, <laughs> at what stage in the gunnery school, either in the instructor school or in the actual gunnery school, did you get to take your first plane? Get on, actually get on board a plane. Well, first. that was at uh, Tyndall Field, Florida. In Florida. Right, and, and what, that was at Panama City. What type of plane did you train on? On a B-24. On a B-24. Right. And uh, interestingly enough, with respect to gunnery training, at that point in time, uh, the students had to be able to assemble and disassemble a 50 caliber machine gun that we would use in waist positions or tail or knee, nose positions blindfolded because of night flying, you know, and some problem that might arise. So uh, it was a rather uh, tough schedule, you know, to get through with just basic gunnery school. And so then uh, all along, Myers, I had appealed to get a reserve, to get a commission to go to OCS. But the unfortunate part about it that I was always en route doing something. It was not being like in a, in a cadre of people stationed for, for, let's say, a year, right. wherein all of this could take place. So that's one reason that I did not get my commission because of that. So, I, so at this point, I just, uh, but I kept going from to place to place. And uh, of course, after leaving Tunnel Field, I did go to Laredo Field, Texas, and then I came back, interestingly enough, was assigned back to Tyndall Field, Florida. So I did basic gunnery instruction there at Tyndall Field. And uh, my main focus was the nose gunner position okay. on B-24s. Now, and, you say your main focus was on the nose gun. Right. Did they, um, did they specifically pick out individuals certain spots or did you cross train on all of them? Well cross train on all of them uh -huh. but you had some individual choice if you wanted to take a certain position and uh, I chose the you know the nose gunner job. Is it, why? Explain to us why you chose that one. Well I just like to see what's ahead <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that I would uh, enjoy that. I would tried the uh, what we call the upper turret you know, the revolving 360 degree turret, and that was interesting. And then uh, the waist positions I practice on because what we would do would be during gunnery school, just even the basic gunnery school, uh, you would practice on uh, using the 50 caliber machine gun in areas that you could use that with a target being flown by another airplane mm -hmm. onto that target, trying to hit the target. And then also, the individuals trained to use a shotgun because we had a range somewhat like a horseshoe track arrangement where you would stay on the back of a truck and fire and develop your 
advance, you know, red, taking the reds to be ahead of the target, you know, so that you would hit the target right, right on. So I did quite a bit of that, uh, so much that when I got out of service, I wasn't interested in shotguns or, <laughs> or going hunting. So <laughs> to this day, I, I don't own a shotgun. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but it was a real enjoyable activity. I always felt comfortable with respect to what I was doing and the service. And, you know, uh, during that period of time, morale was always high. I think some ingredients would be like uh, loyalty, discipline, and uh, courageousness, you know, for any young person to do what we were doing because just the nature of it. Uh, that just, was true in other lines too. Right. Um, just so that you know, we'll all be familiar. Run through the different machine gun positions on the B-24. All right. You have the Emerson nose position, and then the other positions were Martin, as I recall. Uh, then you had a, a lower a lower turret from the bottom of the plane. And the top turret was the rotating turret also. So you had gunners in both stations. Then you had, if the crew was large enough, you had waist gun positions. And then a tail position. And I'm reasonably confident they were Martin equipment items. Okay. But I do know that the nose gunner position was an Emerson turret. Okay. Very good. And, uh, now, when did you, uh, what, what did you do after you left the... Uh, Gunnery Instructor School. Well, there, uh, having gone back to Tyndallfield, Florida, uh -huh. and then that's when I instructed basic right. gunnery and uh, flew from time to time to keep my proficiency up and then uh, taught the Emerson nose turret. Uh, that was one that it was interesting to me, you know, and they would divide the positions. However, I did do some instruction on the other turrets, but you might say a uh, a main line thing was the nose turret. Okay. And uh, so we would do that in what we call sheds uh, with screens and the target being on the screen and this being done through camera, et cetera, uh, on the screen with, uh, with, the boy, with the man in the nose gun position. And so they, we actually had turrets mounted on the tables so that the individual could get up into the table, on the table, and get into the turret and uh, practice. Then we were part of uh, the, what we would call permanent cadre, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore uh, we had naturally barracks, and uh, we were assigned to barracks. And we continued to participate in every morning calisthenics and uh, all types of well, all types of activities. So everyone, everyone was keeping their morale as high as they could. And uh, but I enjoyed my tour there at Tendlefield, Florida. Uh, then from that point, uh, as I recollect, the tenor was somewhat to get more people overseas that knew the B-24. And so I ultimately went to. Overseas Replacement Depot in Greensboro, North Carolina. And from there, you were assigned whatever theater that you were going to be in. Of course, at that time, we had the European theater, we had the American theater, and we had the China, India, Burma, a Pacific theater. And so uh, what happened to me was that I was selected to go on a ship going somewhere that ultimately I found, uh, at least we guessed, that we were going to the China India Burma theater. So we got to the got to Panama and the first indication to us as uh, soldiers or cadre was that uh, gosh this looks like the Panama Canal. And indeed it was, so we moved on into the Panama Canal uh, and there they decided to it, it was all probably already decided, but hundred and seventeen of us were sent through the Panama City, Howard Field, and from Howard Field to, we had an Air Force base in Rio Hatta, and that was about 90 miles north of the Canal Zone. 
And there we were anticipating the utilization of B-24s to come or in also B-24 training because we were all B-24s. And uh, that was at that time one of the longest runways on Air Force bases, and it was long enough to take care of a B-29. And so there we had absolute teams to fly, a captain, pilot, co-pilot, uh, all of us were on teams. And so we flew most every day or every other day, uh, Some, since the main object was anti-submarine patrol on the Pacific, uh, we flew northward from Panama on up uh, Latin America, uh, well up to, I guess, probably as far north as Mexico, really? or maybe to the area beneath Mexico because there was another Air Force base there in the west. There were more, more than one, of course, but there was one that took care of the anti-submarine there. And then we did the position from that point all down through Latin America to, from my standpoint, to Peru, or below Peru to Chile, right in that vicinity. So we flew either down and back or up and back, or in some cases we'd fly some one way, fly another way, and then come back to the center. So uh, we had the crews there, and that was really next to, to combat. So just because I was there teaching flexible gunnery did not, in effect, excuse me right. from going to combat. But while there, uh, I spent about a year before I was discharged. So I spent my last portion of my service there at Riahatta. And, you know, we had two obstacles there quite a bit. We had uh, the jungles, so we had to train for the jungle uh, warfare, or jungle survival, as well as water survival, because you had in our, our area and in the Pacific along the coast there, there were so some, some many sharks. So we had to prepare for uh, having to bail out on water or bail out on the jungle. And I got familiar with the jungle because... Uh, most, uh, maybe two times a week, uh, I had a man to drive me in along with another man up into the jungle and we'd bring back big uh, hands of bananas and hang them on the barracks, you know, for all officers and uh, non-commissioned officers and privates, you know, to, to have. And so uh, that was a big, big deal to get off the base and <laughs> go, to, to go to the jungle. Get <laughs> Go get bananas. Uh, what Air Force was that? This is the Sixth Air Force. Sixth Air Force. Right. Okay. Was it? Was the Sixth all B twenty fours? Some the B twenty fours and B seventeens. Both. Okay. Both. Right. The B seventeens were mostly at Howard Field okay. in Panama or in Panama City, and uh, we were the base for the B twenty fours, and uh, so. How many planes were there? Do you remember? I would say approximately 50, okay. 35 to 50 at all times. And the pictures that I brought will show you some of the okay. show you some of the planes that uh, I took pictures of while on base. And that was not a restricted thing. Uh, soldiers and or non-commissioned officers, uh, officers, I put them in three categories, could take pictures. We were not restricted on that basis. And then we could take pictures in the air. And I took some pictures of flights, you know, squadron flights. And uh, uh, I will digress just long enough to say that in basic training, I feel like that was the beginning of my leadership abilities because we were there and we had to have cadre to take care of 500 to 800 men that would be divided into flights. And so uh, one day uh, the question was, the question came up, the captain came out and talked with a large number of us. And at that time, you know, they were beginning to single out and get people to go to the areas that they were best suited for, even though it was a temporary situation. And so uh, I never shall forget that uh, the captain had asked, have, have any of you taken ROTC? and even to the inclusion of Boy Scouts. And I had done both, so I timidly raised my arm. And he said, well, you're going to be a, a flight 
so flight lieutenant. Now, with that meaning, you know, a, tra a training flight lieutenant or a small company. You know, so I was responsible there for the assembling and disassembling of that flight in the squadron to take them to the mess hall, to take them to whatever area that they had to be in. And that was over, well, the overseer was really a non-commissioned officer and probably a couple or three captains, maybe one or two lieutenants. But I just wanted to digress there to say that yeah. that was a meaningful part of my life as I look back to it, to know that, you know, had I not done that, then maybe I wouldn't have developed um, some leadership skills that I would have had to have learned elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So that helped me a whole lot. And uh, But getting back to uh, the war there and in the Pacific, uh, these were all, all highly trained crews. And uh, there was a great deal of development and uh, some cross-training. And uh, if you were not... If you were not uh, flying, you had assignments like I was assigned in headquarters to do certain types of jobs. Uh, it was always a full day's work. Uh, very, you know, you would just like you would do today. You may get off a day during the week, but basically that was it. Not quite as much latitude as in the states as far as being off for a weekend. Right. So. Did uh, was there ever any talk? that uh, as the war in the Pacific uh, was, was significantly going against the Japanese, that you guys may be moved and deployed right. closer to uh, combat. Yeah, to the, to the front. Right. And interestingly enough, that when I was at Tyndall Field, Florida, and doing the instructing job, we had quite a number of personnel coming back from the European theater who were, in, who were men, both officers and uh, non-commissioned officers, that were, re you might say, recycling. And they would have us to retrain them in the field of the gunnery part. And uh, there I got a real good glimpse of what, was it, what it was like, let's say, flying over France and Germany because these men had so many experiences that they would share. They were very, very timid individuals. I, by that I mean not timid in nature, but very reluctant to talk much about their experiences. And uh, I do recall talking with a number of them, and I did not raise the questions. They just came up. Right. But uh, some interesting things that they knew that were happening in uh, Germany, and uh, it was not restricted type information as you and I would expect today, but... Uh, uh, I would tell my friends, you know, about these, uh, not, well, I guess you could put it into the, the, quote, atrocity area. And uh, people just wouldn't believe you back home in a way, you know, that's just too far-fetched. But it really was happening. And uh, people didn't really have, I think, quite as much grasp on the military as we did while in the military. It's not that they were things were not kept secret. It was just that, I guess at that time, radio and uh, dissemination of information was not as great as it is today with respect to warfare. So, uh, but we were, we were looking to be assigned to China, India, Burma theater from that point. Yeah. It would have been redundant to go back to uh, the European theater. Right. So we were always alert to that. But uh, fortunately, from the standpoint of all of us, uh, whereas we were loyal and ready to continue on, and uh, the war closed, and in June of '46 I was discharged, and came back to the states, and was discharged at Fort McPherson, where I started in 1944. So uh, I came back to the same point, and uh, but I enjoyed my experiences there. Uh, had some real what I would say, look in retrospect, uh, real rich experiences. And uh, I feel like the discipline uh, really meant a lot to me. And of course, ultimately, going out, coming out of service, uh, the GI Bill of Rights had occurred. And then I was able to utilize the GI Bill of Rights to finish my college education at the University of Georgia. And then uh, I started law school there. So uh, that was a big benefit. So you went to, to Tech me. and Georgia. Right. 
and uh, I still subscribe to both schools. <laughs> so who you pull for? It just depends. If I'm in Georgia, I pull for Georgia. <laughs> tech, I pull for Tech. No, uh, I have a strong bond with Tech uh -huh. because as a boy, uh, I had an older cousin that went there, and he and two or three of his friends had these old, and George Hightower can tell you more about them because he built a number of them, what we call cut downs, just old Model A Fords, Model T Fords, that were just sort of cut down from the top. Uh -huh. And I would ride over to the Tech campus a lot of times with these much older boys. So, uh, you know, I was a tag along, so I just felt like that uh, Tech was the place for me. Yeah. And uh, I had refocused. I came back home and uh, during the, while I was in the service, I took some correspondence courses and uh, decided that my interest was more in the commerce side and the legal side. So when I came back to Tech, I had a good friend, quote, student, good friend, who was the head of what is now the Industrial Management Department. His name was Dr. Dennison. And he was just beginning to form the Industrial Management School at Tech. This was in 46. And so rather than wait for that to occur and having to virtually start over in engineering, Dr. Dennison said, well, Al, you know, the University of Georgia has a fine business administration school, and I would recommend you going there. So in that case, I took his advice and went to the University of Georgia. He could have said, well, I think you ought to stay here, but I think in all fairness to me as a young person or as to a student, he gave me the good advice to do that, and uh, so I, I appreciated that. And uh, ultimately, the industrial management school from the old commerce school, that was at time of transition, really took uh, took off, quote, and uh, became this, the, I guess now, what would you say, the Industrial Management Engineering School, Industrial Engineering School. Just so. to, to, to backtrack just a tad. Sure. The plane, did you fly, did, you, did your crew, your team fly the same plane every time? Yes. What, did you name the plane? Uh, no, our plane was not named. Huh. Uh, there, there were several there that were, so, several of the older ships had names, pictures of which I took. But the particular ship I had, we did not have uh, a picture on it. We ultimately got into a ship that did have a picture, and I believe I have a picture of that in okay, there, good. of that particular ship. I do not recall the name of it. Uh, I guess you could put uh, in quotes the American girl, but... Uh, there were names on certain ships, mm -hmm. and so, but I had a crew, and interestingly enough, there were several men there. I happened to be a Sigma Nu in college, and uh, I found several Sigma Nu's, both officers and non-commissioned officers, and we formed a little group, and I kept up with uh, one of them who was captain here in Atlanta for a good long while, and uh, we had a picture all taken together, and maybe I have that in my book, but I remember that well, and where impossible, we would fly together, just as a sort of a mixed, mixed crew, and that, and that was really fun, and then the, uh, one of the lieutenant colonels in command happened to be a Sigma Nu, so he was the real senior officer, as you know, among all of us, and he was just a real friendly individual, so I think the high point was that both Enlisted, when I say enlisted, now I'm saying people who enlisted, whether through, through, through draft or volunteering, enlisted and non-commissioned officers as I was and commissioned officers all blended together. It was just a great camaraderie. And you wouldn't think that considering the diverse areas. But again, I come back to the matter of discipline. And I think that helped in that particular era, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody was dedicated and focused on what they were doing, proud of what they were doing, and uh, everyone had high, high esprit de corps, especially there in Panama with this particular Air Force base. If I remember correctly, and I have a picture of it in the album, they are Milton Caniff, you know, the, uh, the artist for newspapers. Okay. Uh, uh, really kind of focused on the 6th Air Force Base. And he would have uh, pictures drawn of, uh, you know, sophisticated ladies with long dresses, 
and this type thing, and uh, it was really interesting, and that kind of added to the the uh, the camaraderie, the S, you know. So the Sixth Air Force Base was well known there in the Pacific, and I believe I would be safe in saying that the uh, Pacific, uh, the China, Bur China, India, Burma theater saw this happening. I knew about it some way or another, and they realize it, hopefully, that there would be these individuals, you know, that would leave Rio Hatta and leave Panama City, Florida, Panama City, Panama, mm -hmm. to go to these, to go to this theater. So, uh, again, we were all preparing, and, uh, but I thought that was interesting because a lot was focused. In fact, uh, we would fly across the equator, and if you flew across the equator when you got back, uh, they would send off and give you a certificate that you've crossed the equator. It was almost like uh, today we don't do that necessarily. I don't know if I've been I've been in flight a lot of times uh, since then, but uh, today the commercial airlines don't do that. At one time I think they did, but it, it's costly. Yeah. But we would all get a certificate for. Maybe I have one in that book. I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, that was kind of a neat thing. Everything was really sort of a comes together in a neat way, you know, and uh, we had good relations with what we had. We had an NCO club, non-commissioned officers club there. We had an officers club, well established. We had uh, the USO people there to have activities. We had theater. Uh, we did have to do our, most of our washing ourselves. It wasn't like back in the States, you know, where you could route your clothes out for for laundry. So we did a lot of that our own in our own way. But we had some facility for, like, uniforms, you know, the pressing and so forth. But we had a large number of personnel there that were Indians from that area. Okay. And it's called, the, they were called the Sandblast Indians. Huh. And they were very short in stature, but very brawny and strong. In fact, I only saw one fight while I was there among the, sun, the, the Indians themselves. And uh, I mean, it was just a real fight. And, uh, but ordinarily, they were all peaceful. They did jobs like KP, you know, in the dining hall, mess hall. Uh, we never did have to do that at all as far as our personnel was concerned. So all of that was kind of furnished. Now, when you got, uh, or let me go, how often were you getting mail from, from the States? I'm sure it was pretty regular. It was pretty regular, uh, at least uh, three times a week. Wow. And uh, we, we, were, we were kept informed right much. I, I would say probably three times a week. Could have been two times, but enough to keep people's uh, uh, spirit up you know, about looking forward to mail from home and we could mail letters. And I do not recall the letters being censored. Now, I know that in the uh, other theaters, especially in the European theater, to, toward uh, 1942 and 43, they were doing a lot of censoring of material. And uh, I don't recollect my family or my friends making a comment about the censorship. I have seen documents. I've seen letters. In fact, I've got some at home that were passed on to me that you could tell how the censorship worked. Mm -hmm. But I was not, we were not involved to that extent. But did you keep a lot of letters that you received? Yes, I did, Elizabeth. I kept quite a number of them. And uh, ultimately, my mother uh, discarded them because uh, I had them in her attic. And she had to keep the attic clean. And I lost a lot of good things in the, in the attic oh, yeah. shuffle. <laughs> but my mother not realizing it, you know. And uh, in fact, I was telling someone the other day, they had this picture on the wall of Marilyn Monroe. And I said, well, gosh, I remember when I was a boy, two or three of us knew about the Metro Goldwyn Mayer people who were located down, at, well, really it was like movie row, down on the Ivy, well, I believe, yes, that's right, uh, Ivy Street. And uh, you could go down there, well, only two or three of us learned about it, but we'd go down there on Saturdays, a day off, and We'd ask for these pictures, and I, I, had a, I must have had 75 uh, to 100 
pictures of movie stars. Wow. Just tremendous. And I could not, re I cannot find those today. I have a lot of, you know, I have a lot of things from that era. Uh -huh. I had about 150 of these little, these big little books. You may have seen them. Mm -hmm. uh, small books about that thick, about an inch and a half to two inches thick. And I gave those to my son and other relics of that era that I thought would be good to pass along, you know, to just for what was happening during that time. But uh, I lost all my pictures. And uh, just, uh, anyway, so much for that. But just thinking of uh, how pictures now have come to be so important. Right. And uh, picture uh, photography. You've uh, told us a lot about the material we were going to cover. I think one of the questions uh, that we have tried to ask just about everybody we've interviewed because it seems to be a topic that's debated in the present more than it ever was at the time. But what were your thoughts on the dropping of the atomic weapons on the Japanese? Well, from the humanity standpoint, I was concerned about it. However, from the wartime standpoint and the atrocities that had occurred and some of our soldiers and officers being involved, uh, I had to go along with the fact that this was indeed, quote, payback mm -hmm. time. And we fought a tremendous war in the Pacific. And there were a lot of people who, like myself, who had had jungle training that actually put this kind of training into effect in the China Bur Burma India Theater. Because if I'm not mistaken, the 8th Air Force was uh, stationed up in the mountains there in that area. And uh, I know I've talked with George Hightower a couple of times, and he's referred to those, that particular area, but uh, it now, in today's society, uh, I would think differently toward it. Uh, I will say that I believe from most all who were in service, it was somewhat difficult to come back and phase in with people who had immigrated to this country from Germany or from Japan. No isolation, no bar, you know, just a little different. You know, it was just a difference there that was invisible, if you will, that uh, you wondered, well, where was that person when I was fighting there or when I was there? And uh, and I, that still exists today, Myers. I, I have friends who have come to in various uh, uh, official positions, like with Coca-Cola Company and other organizations, other companies that have come here from those lands, and uh, you know, they maybe my age or nearly my age, and I never asked them where they were. If one volunteered to tell me, that would be fine. I've only had one person to volunteer to talk about the, her background. This is a woman who married a man while he was uh, stationed in the European theater, and she was from Germany, but she was a, a girl, little girl. And she talked a lot about her father and uh, the fact that the father uh, was inv involved with the Germans and he was taken off. He, the belief there, basically, was that this was going to be a new era and new things and poverty would be less and there would be a greater life ahead. And a lot of people were just blindfolded to the fact that they were going to have all of this to happen and ultimately the atrocities happened. And I think the German people realized the atrocities after the war faster than the Japanese did. But nevertheless, uh, if I'm answering your question appropriately, yeah. I think that uh, then I, I really had a, a high degree of, uh, not animosity, but just, gosh, how could these people fly over Pearl Harbor in peacetime and bomb Pearl Harbor and get away with it? and continue to fight the war. And uh, they outstripped us in many cases with respect to uh, air power. They had a lot of, you know, they had a lot of uh, uh, ships at sea that were greater than some of our ships. And, but we, the, the buildup was so great in America. And the people at home were so conscientious, well, you've heard this before, but were so conscientious about helping the war effort. Like I just, could uh, name several people who saved uh, tenfold from cigarette 
packages, uh, packages of cigarettes uh, that they would form into a ball and give the ball to whomever was taking it, you know. Or they would give uh, salvage things that they had. So the, on the American front, these people were doing a lot to be courageous, to help people, you know, to help our, over, to help our service personnel. And so I had to kind of put that in perspective, too, that it wasn't just the military people, but a lot of people back home that were doing a lot, too. So that's kind of the way I felt. But like I said today, to repeat myself, uh, I'm really disappointed that it all happened. I do feel like that uh, there needs to be greater communication with the younger people, particularly in Japan. Uh, I think this is an era where somewhat of the history due to age is becoming erased and young people don't really know too much what happened then and naturally so because gosh this is 50 years ago and uh, yet on the other hand you would like to see some degree of understanding now my wife Betty and I have been to Pearl Harbor to Hawaii and uh, we've joined other people the Japanese there too they are interested in coming there and seeing these uh, seeing the Pearl Harbor uh, monuments and seeing the ships that were uh, were bombed, bombed and uh, still lay there in the in the harbor, and uh, so they are there too. So I give them credit for seeing it and understanding it. But uh, at that time, it was a different situation. So uh, one uh, one last question that I have, then I'll let you. Have you been back to Panama? No, I haven't, but I'm planning to go. I have had several friends who have done this more recently. I think uh, I've been in contact with more people in the last three years that are taking cruises there. Uh -huh. Betty and I have not been on a cruise. Number one, we have not been on a cruise. We've been on a number of ferries, like going from, uh, Hel well, from Helsinki mm -hmm. to uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, and other points but not on a cruise ship just to enjoy a leisurely cruise. So we, we are thinking in terms of doing that. Now we did go to Alaska, but again, we didn't take a cruise inward through the passage, the Northwest Passage, but we did fly into uh, Burb uh, to uh, Fairbanks and to... Uh, uh, I'll take that back, I got one more question. Yeah. Have, have you been involved in any veterans organizations or, or anything like that? Or? Well, yes, I have. Uh, I'm not a member of the American Rebel. Excuse me. I'm not a member of the uh, American Legion. Uh -huh. uh, I, I have affiliated with what we call the Sons of Confederate Veterans mm -hmm. and the S Sons of American Revolution, and they were the first two organizations I joined because I have I have been doing family history for about the last five years, and over that period of time have col collected a lot of. Uh, memorabilia and items, you know, that would sort of define my family, not on any uh, uh, narrative type based, you know, not written form, but just documents. Mm -hmm. And so uh, then I've, uh, I am a member of the Old Guard, as you know, right. and I've joined a number of other hereditary societies, and that's all come about through my interest in the history aspect need to learn a lot more about the history, early American history, but at any rate, uh, I feel like these organizations do a lot to keep people involved, not only people my age, but younger people. But uh, So we have a cross-section of age. And so what you have to do, of course, as you know, is to prove your lineage from some, as a descendant, from some uh, forebear to uh, join the organization and, and document it. So I got so involved with all of this that uh, I just decided, well, I'd just keep on with this family history. And now I've just got probably eight volumes, three-inch notebooks filled wow. with, uh, para you know, with uh, all kinds of documents, magazine articles. In fact, I came down to the Atlanta History Center, I think, about four years ago uh, to uh, use the library. And uh, I was trying to find the obituary Maybe I told you this, but I found the obituary of my grandmother. My grandfather and grandmother came to Atlanta. My grandfather was among the first coal dealers here in Atlanta. And uh, I did mention that to you. But 
at any rate, uh, his three brothers were in the as were in the Confederacy. One was a captain; the others were either a corporal or a private. And so, uh, with that, I was trying to find my grandmother's obituary. Well, I looked through. I guess I must have spent an hour and a half or more looking through the Atlanta Journal for the obituary when I believe uh, either Ann Salter or, uh, and I do not recall the first name, but I call her Miss Saunders, uh, told me, well, you know that at that time, just because a person died on a certain day, that didn't really mean that they were going to have this article in the paper like we see it today. So with that, I continued on, you know, and did find it. But it was like, 10 days to 15 days after her death. So anyway, that's, uh, so that's the kind of thing I've just gathered in all my, in all my albums. Death certificates, birth certificates, etc. Uh, you didn't need to know all that, but... <laughs> that's okay. Let's... Was I a minister at Peachtree Road Methodist Church? And I could believe it. You know, I hadn't seen her since early war, and she was leaving as a Navy officer to come back to the States to marry this naval officer and I went to their wedding and uh, that was a real shock to me you know to just come across somebody I really knew from back in Atlanta that was on the ship otherwise everybody else were just totally strangers except for those friends that you'd meet you know and friends that you'd make because and, and you ran into her on the ship ran, ran into her on the ship on the way, and back, on the way back from Panama to New Orleans we I feel to tell you that uh, at one point I was in New Orleans and it was transferred really from New Orleans. It was a, like an overseas replacement depot, but they didn't process all the personnel there. I guess in retrospect, they processed certain personnel that were going to North Carolina for the overseas, you know, replacement uh, or to some other point. So... Uh, I have. As a matter of fact, recently I thought, well, in fact, it was just two nights ago uh, I was talking with my son. When I came out of service, they gave us all of our air equipment, as we call it. Uh, I had my flight suit, uh, suits, and I had my uh, heavy-duty wear, uh, sheep line jacket, trousers, boots, gloves, that we used because we were flying at altitudes of around 10,000 or more feet. And so I had all of that, and I, I told my son, I said, well, it was really his wife, my daughter-in-law, I said, well, you know, I served as a model because they were, came around something one day and asked if uh, any of you would be willing to try on this equipment, let us see what it looked like. So I've got some pictures in there of me doing my modeling. I, I said I had a short modeling career. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, anyway, was, was so I, ever, oh, go ahead. I'm no, gonna, I was just going to say, and for the longest, I had my World War II flight jacket, which was a leather flight jacket, and it just completely wore out. And my son-in-law's father was in World War II and in Air Force, and uh, so he passed on his jacket to me because he had outgrown it. Wow. And so I can wear that jacket. The only difference in mine and that is that on mine, I had uh, stencil, had it stencil, Air Force st symbol, you know, but not all did this, so, but I did, and, uh, and it, well, you've seen jackets like that, right. where you've you got... you still have your coat? I, I still have my World War II uniform coat. Really? I, I, was, I was a sergeant, came out of service as a sergeant, mm -hmm. and uh, at that point, we would call them buck sergeants. We had a staff sergeant, but upgrade from a staff sergeant to technical sergeant, to master sergeant in all those grades. And of course, uh, I was among a younger group, so a lot of this promotion had occurred not to, uh, in any way, to be jealous of the fact, but a lot of these people had already received their commissions and received these higher positions based on the time they went in service. So you couldn't advance like you could have advanced a year prior there too. Uh, no problem, it's just that was the case. So uh, I'm not coming in defense of the fact that I was a sergeant. I was proud to be a sergeant and that I had advanced to that point, plus the fact that I was glad to be discharged and be given the Good Conduct Medal. 
So I was a, I was trying to be a good soldier. <laughs> yeah. In addition to the Good Conduct Medal, were you, were the people in that area given any other commendation? Yes, the the American Theater Medal. Okay. And we had three medals, as I recall: the European Theater Medal, the Pacific Theater, and the American Theater. Okay. Now the American Theater would include those people who were doing similar and same types of jobs on the coast, you know, okay. uh, in that area. It was not just for within the states. Now, I'm sure people uh, interpreted it to be, you know, that's an individual thing, but when you were discharged, they gave you that medal and gave you the good conduct medal if you got it, you know, and then uh, the victory medal. Now, since then, just recently, being in the reserve, I could tell you this story, but cutting all of that out, I learned about the Armed Forces Reserve Medal, and I really qualified for it, but I did not know about it. And it was through a conversation at the old guard meeting that I learned that this ribbon that this man was wearing, you know we wear uniforms, right. and all the members uh, are encouraged to wear their uh, particular medals, not medals, but the bars or the ribbons. Right. And so I saw this ribbon that looked unusual to me, and I questioned it and learned about it. So I called the Air Force Reserve in Marietta, talked with an officer there, and told him about my background and so forth. And he said, yes, says, uh, you would be, he didn't tell me that right off, but he says, I believe probably you would be entitled to it. And so I sent him copies of my discharges, you know, both uh, non commit well, both uh, enlisted as well as my officership discharge and told him when I was in service. Well, of course, the discharge papers uh, that I had showed the dates, so it wasn't any question about that. So he called me back and said, yes, says, uh, you're qualified to receive it, and uh, I'm going to have it sent to you, and it should be there within 10 to 15 days. Wow. And I uh, got it just immediately. And I'd already gone around the horn to Midwest, and I couldn't get beyond just a telephone call, you know, because of the large cadre that they have there, mm -hmm. only to tell me that I wouldn't qualify based on being a World War II veteran. That, I, that you know, they had everything geared to the present, right. but not in the past, you know. So uh, th luckily for me, this officer realized that after we talked, and so he sent that to me. So I really have that medal in, addi in addition to those other three. And uh, needless to say, I was proud to receive those. All right, we're going to... All right, the gunner's vow started off, I wish to be a pilot, and you along with me, but if we all were pilots, where would the Air Force be? And it continues, you know, to signify the fact that, you know, you could be gunners or armorers or whatever. And then this was the, uh, this was actually a cut out, cut off of an envelope uh, showing the wings of a gunner. Here, let's, uh, let me get a tight shot of that. Okay. All right. Now, I'm just going to pass over these pictures here. These are just pictures taken in the barracks back in the States at different places. Uh, this is a longtime high school friend who died of cancer probably 10 years ago, and uh, same individual. I'm just going to turn through and get to the Air Force. I thought I'd show you a picture of two of uh, Tyndallfield, Florida. That's where I took these pictures. Let's see here. Uh, this gives you a view of the barracks. These barracks still exist there today. Oh, really? Yes, in fact, have you, I... Have you been back there? Yes, I have. I've been back on two occasions. I took Betty uh, back. She's Her name is Elizabeth, Mary Elizabeth. I took her back to just see if the, the uh, facilities really still existed, and it did. But I, after I retired from Southern Bell, mm -hmm. or now Bell South, uh, I went to work with the Atlanta Area Council Boy Scouts and worked with them for about 10 years, and we would have conferences at different places. So one place was the officer quarters at Panama City at, at Tyndall Field, Florida. Huh. So it, I is was, this you right here? Yes. Let me, get a, let me get a good shot of that. Gosh, I sure wish I had that waistline. <laughs> <laughs> I, Myers, I haven't looked at this in a long time. All I did was thumb the page 
to uh, get to the sixth okay. Air Force. And uh, we had, this is the Air Force emblem. Uh, this was a very, uh, much of a display at Tyndall Field, Florida. And uh, that, again, is a picture of me. It looks like I'm uh, possessed with pictures of myself. But, <laughs> well, I took pictures of others, and they would take pictures of me. Uh, all right, now I mentioned to you about being a model. And so here is some of the gear. Now, this happened to be the uniform or the flight equipment that I brought home. Uh, fur line jacket, uh, headgear, uh, leggings or pantsuit, and then the, I have on my regular shoes there, but here in this one you see that I had flight shoes on. These are boots. This is another piece that uh, was another type of a uniform that was uh, electrified. This was not electrified. This was later equipment. Now, I do not know whether it was ultimately used or not, but yeah. it was on a trial basis. Was that unusual that you got to bring your stuff home? No, it wasn't. Not from, not from the point that I was, uh, that I, point that I left at Rio Hatta. Okay. In other words, we were all permitted and had uh, possession of items. I had a machine.